Welcome to the Engineering Room, a monthly series of long-form conversations with influential people from the software world. The Engineering Room series is sponsored by Equal Experts, and I'd like to thank them for their ongoing support. So if you'd like some help building some great software or are looking for a great place to work, do check them out. The link's in the description below. This is the second visit to the Engineering Room for today's guest. He's my friend and former colleague, the always fascinating Gregor Hope. Uh, Gregor is a world-class expert on software architecture, the role of the architect, uh, and he's a technologist and expert on the topics of large-scale systems, the cloud, as well as lots of other stuff. He's now part of the serverless team working as an enterprise strategist for AWS, and in the past was a technical director in the office of the CTO at Google. Before that, he was chief software architect at Allianz, the, the German insurance giant. Gregor is an international speaker, author of some great books, as well as writing on, it, on his always thought-provoking blog, The Architect Elevator. He's also just published a new uh, book called Platform Strategy, so we thought it'd be good to talk about platforms a bit today. He's thoughtful, full of wisdom, and the last time we enjoyed ourselves a lot, so I'm really looking forward to catching up with him again here today. Gregor, welcome. Yeah. Welcome as well, and I'm glad to be back. Maybe all my bad jokes from last time weren't so horrible <laughs> that you invited me back, nevertheless. So no, glad no, to some, glad to hear that. Yeah, no, some of them were too horrible, so don't do that again. <laughs> 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 Only kidding, of course. Um, let's let's start by by thinking a little bit about what we mean by platforms. People seem to be calling everything a platform these days, and it it is an idea that's been around for a long time. So. So when you're talking about platforms and platform strategy, what, what is it that you really mean? Mm. Yeah, and, and your question is actually part of the reason I even set out to write a book. So challenges we have in the industry is that, well, A, we're not good with naming, it's number one. So once we have a name, we tend to attach it to just about everything. And the other part is that we often forget what's really behind a, a name. So I think the concept of a platform is actually quite valuable. It's also not entirely new. And the way I look at it is platforms are ways to standardize some aspects of your system, but in a way that it actually boosts innovation and diversity on top of that layer. Like we, we tend to have this challenge that the more we make something common, the more we harmonize it, the less flexibility we have on top. But platforms have sort of this magical property that yes, you can harmonize something, you can make a common layer, but on top of this layer, you seem to have a lot of freedom. So there's an important nuance in there that I think does warrant talking about platforms. But as I said, the challenge is, A, we believe we invented everything, which isn't the case here. And then B, we, we tend to stick the label on just about anything we can find. And of course, that, that doesn't help. I, I, I find it quite hard to, dis, to distinguish between platform and just good design. Um, so, so, you know, design is often about, you know, finding finding these seams of abstraction th through which we can separate concerns. I, I like the idea of, of of kind of maintaining freedom and so choosing abstractions that, that aren't, you know, too abstract and too, you know, divorcing us too far from what's going on uh, sufficiently that we can kind of manipulate the tools. But even so, it seems like it's it's just one take on the way that we carve up our systems by design. Yeah, I would say there's something there. You, you, in a way, you could say um, platforms are abstractions that actually work, <laughs> maybe because <laughs> find, finding good abstractions is actually very hard. And one of the chapters in the book is, you know, build abstractions, not illusions, right? It's very easy yeah. to over abstract and then important elements are hidden and that becomes a dangerous illusion. You give people the illusion that something is in a certain way that it actually isn't. My favorite example is always RPC, remote procedure calls. You say, oh, this is just like a local procedure call, except it totally is not because yeah. it's distributed, has high latency, it doesn't have a call stack, it has different type systems, partial failures, you know, it, that's another book I wrote, but, but there's a long list of things that is, and, and then that becomes a dangerous illusion. And 
vice versa. You know, I already made fun of us naming things poorly. You know, abstraction is another one of those words where people are like, oh, I abstracted something, but not all of these abstractions are actually meaningful. So getting this, getting this right, I would say is in a way leads you at least close to what a, a good platform would be. And I think in a previous post, you had a prime example, right? You said, hey, isn't like operating system like a platform? And I would say, yeah, that's actually a very nice example because it abstracts away a lot of the physical aspects, right? That otherwise yeah. would be very tedious to deal with. But on top of it, you build whatever whatever you please, right? The, you know, the operating system doesn't seem to constrain you a whole lot in what you can build. And I would say that is good software engineering. The, the part that we should scratch our heads over is, now why does this happen only once every 20 or 30 years <laughs> that we find something where, where this actually seems to pan out properly, right? Yeah. It seems to be like operating systems, then the internet, the cloud, right? There seem to be sort of big gaps between successful platforms. I guess I guess another another aspect of both good design and platforms is that they kind of take work away for, from you so that they make things simpler. So when operating systems started in, you know introduced ideas like printer drivers we we no longer had to know the details of individual printers to be able to print something out. Yeah, isn't did, <clears throat> nobody wishes themselves back to yeah. the good old days without <laughs> printer drivers, display drivers. Um, the early Linux fans, right? They they know what it feels like to go a little bit back on that time scale where <laughs> yeah. oh my latest graphics card doesn't yeah. quite you know play with it. Luckily, I think we we are past that point. But yes, um, at the same time, we have to admit now you could say a printer is a relatively simple device, right? You send a character yeah. stream, some formatting stuff, and it like somehow puts this on paper. It still took what decades probably in the end to really get that right to understand what should be taken away and what should be kept um i myself i remember i worked for hp you were packard in the old days when you know, it was really still fun to work there at a printer division and this must have been or like 91 like everybody knows this is the grumpy old guys club here so <laughs> yeah. i'm not afraid of dating myself so back in 91 i worked on something called remote control front panel and that was one of the early ideas that you could control your printer from a GUI and you could send um, command strings to your printer to reconfigure the printer. So those were the early days of seeing a printer as a software device that does more than just here's a character stream that you put on paper. Yeah. And it's still taken some decades to really figure out what's what's in that box and what is out of that box. So. <clears throat> So the way that we've been talking about it and framing it so far, most of all of our examples, I think we, we're talking about um, system software companies building this stuff, operating system level things, cloud mm -hmm. cloud level services. So are platforms really the primary preserve of the Googles and Amazons and Microsofts of the world? So at least they have a large hand in it so the i mean i work as you said right i work on serverless engineering and uh, interestingly we don't like to use the word platform but as an architect i would say you know the cloud things pretty much are platforms and the colleagues have the p in the name so so i think they're happy with a with a with a p word in there um i would say that um there's two parts to two answers to to your question on, on one hand what i just described about platforms standardizing a lot of things, but then making them available in a way that it drives innovation, that ha happens at a very interesting layer in, in the stack. And that layer is often where underneath you have a scale effect. And in the early days, the scale effect might have been that building an operating system is a lot of work, like in the Windows days, at least it was, yeah. or in the cloud term, right, data centers, um, you know, global networks, like huge capital invest. So for that definition of platforms, that kind of makes it, you know, the, the hyperscaler kind of thing is natural for it because underneath you have that scale effect that just requires heavy invest. But the magic is that the people on top are not subject to this scale effect. 
right? So you can deploy one Lambda function and you know, run it for one millisecond and you pay for one millisecond, 0, 0.0, how many ever pennies that comes out to be. So that is one of these magical properties of platform. So that's first part of the answer. We shouldn't be surprised that this always happens where somebody underneath does a lot of heavy engineering, but on top, you want to have it be easily accessible. Now, recently though, and our world is always fractal, so we can always layer something on top of something else. So a lot of people building platforms in-house, right? Mm -hmm. And yeah. luckily, they're not building them from scratch. They're usually building them on top of a cloud or analytics or a data platform. But I think they're feeling sort of a little bit what you just touched on that. Yes, you can build your own in-house platform, no problem. And that can be valuable because... I always tell people, you can make assumptions that we, we as AWS, we here cannot necessarily make, right? We need to build for the whole world and so need the Azure's and GCP's of the world versus you need to build only for one organization. So you can make assumptions that we cannot easily make. So yes, you know, there is room for reducing cognitive load and standardizing processes or APIs. So that is really good. But, and here comes the second part is, A, these economics, right? are very different for you than for a large provider. And B, don't underestimate how difficult it is to build these kind of things. We joked about yeah. it, right? We find a good one once every 20 years, and it's yeah. not because of lack of trying. So everybody going and saying, oh, I'm going to build a platform because that's like the great thing to do right now. I caution people a little bit. And that's part of the book also to say like, hey, here are some things you should really think about before you jump onto that bandwagon so 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 if uh, <clears throat> i think we're I, I think we're in strong agreement or, you know not unusually but here in, in that uh, i think the way that i would phrase that <clears throat> is that a good in-house platform is able to um you know narrow narrow the variables based on local context you can say you know, we are we're we're doing this thing. We don't need all of that other variance. Therefore, we can abstract just a little bit further, or you know, we can create this platform to hide a little more detail because we're not trying to keep cope with as general a case as Google or Amazon or whoever else is building your cloud infrastructure. Cool, correct, and that is good. Where it gets tricky is that a you generally have many cooks in the kitchen. So when yeah. this platform thing starts, the Security people are promised that you have more compliance and more constraints. The developers are being promised that they're more productive. Um, the architects are being promised that everything will follow um, common architecture standards. And I don't think it's impossible to do that, but you need to be really careful whether one thing can really achieve all these, these different aspects that you're after. So give you a classical example where people sort of jump on this bandwagon without really getting the nuances. So like you said, right, we can make additional assumptions. We don't need to build for the whole world. So we can probably simplify the usage of the base platform, right? However, this often starts with people setting default values. So let's say you want the DynamoDB database, right? And you say, oh, yeah. our developers don't really need, we always have replication on and we always have this, this provisioning model and we have this, right? So we make some default settings and isn't this really useful for the developers, less cognitive no, uh, load, yada, yada. Sounds good, but doesn't always end good. And the example I tend to give there is, if somebody has a thousand piece puzzle, and you say, hey, let's make this easier. It doesn't help if you take 100 pieces away. You actually, yeah. you actually made the puzzle piece harder, right? Because now you have like missing pieces. So setting default values can have good intentions, but it's usually not an abstraction because we poked at that word early. Right? Like yeah. a, a good abstraction would introduce a new vocabulary, right? It would lift things in a different domain, like an operating system. Let's say you read and write a file. The vocabulary <coughs> for that is streams, right? Or sockets yeah. for network, right? Not disk sectors, right? And magnetic encodings, right? So you have a different 
vocabulary. And I feel this is an important part that people miss. They want to take the base platform and then they set a few defaults and they don't allow you to use this availability zone and they don't allow you to use that service. And they say, oh, look, your cognitive load just went down because now you only choose from three availability zones versus 32. And of course, that, that absolutely doesn't make any developer's lives easier. If anything, it makes it harder because maybe they wanted to use the service that you just disallowed. So yeah. getting that right is a lot more involved than I, I find people generally expect. And this is one of the one, this is one of the, the anti patterns in, in the adoption of what people are calling platform engineering, that kind of gets under my skin a bit and worries me in terms of its impact, which is an awful lot of organisations that I come across call what they're doing platform engineering, which but what it really means is that they've got a team of people that believe that they under, understand cloud infrastructure and try to hide the use of cloud infrastructure from their other teams without adding any of those extra constraints or abstractions in any meaningful way. As you say, they're just doing the configuration for for the teams and that doesn't seem like a sensible use of this this these yep. these light approaches at all. Um, I see that. I see that quite a lot. And yeah. Just quickly to this, quite honestly, mm -hmm. I think the main reason for that is organizational in most cases, because, yeah, well, let's talk about the name platform again, right? Platform is the thing that sits sort of underneath other stuff. So people go in the organization and said, well, who is the team that makes things that sit underneath other stuff? And then it turns out, oh, that's the infrastructure and operations team, right? Generally, because yeah. They are the ones who deal with servers and networks and storage infrastructure. So isn't this the right place to make platforms? And mm. it's not impossible, but I would say it's a really tall order. I have a chapter in the book that basically says um, that IT services and platform are antonyms. They're like the complete opposite of yes. each other. And if you use the same team, you know, you shouldn't be too surprised if you find out that you're platform looks more like a classic IT services organization. Oh, I yes. need a virtual machine or I need a container or whatever it is. Yeah. And then some ticketing system kicks off. And, you know, at some point with a little bit of luck, like, you know, the container runtime comes out, but that, that is not a platform. <laughs> yeah. And everybody like you and me is running for the hills when anybody mentions a ticketing system. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Uh, That's yeah, the last yeah. thing you want. Yeah, yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, and, and so the <clears throat> Is there any? I, I absolutely agree with you know with 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 what you said there too. But is is there anything else that we can say that kind of defines a platform? I've got one thing in mind in terms of I think to build a platform, you've got to understand the problem domain of what the system that you're building very well. Ah, very nice. So <clears throat> a keyword do, domain there. Yes. Yeah, so let me yeah. let me back out tiny bit because we are yeah, sort of chatting, chatting openly. So there's one good test that I want to give people who build platforms. And that is unlike other common layers, platforms do not try to anticipate all use cases, right? So when I look in business, I often see these business platforms where they say, oh, we're the insurance business. So here's the core of all insurance and here's the country specific insurance thing. And then here's for the product, you just like make a few configuration settings, A, B or C. Sounds really good on PowerPoint, right? Doesn't work at all because the assumption is that you know all the needs of all your users up front and you can go and build exactly that. Now, there might be people who are a ton smarter than me, but at least I would never claim to, to be able to do that. So one important test for platforms is have people built something that you have not anticipated, right? Yeah. Because if not, then you're probably not at the at the right level and you're falling back into the old model of, oh, I try, I'm smarter than everybody else. So I try to anticipate all their needs and I just put it in this layer. And then basically they have to do almost nothing, right? That's doesn't work. So yeah. the, the way to get there and coming back to your question is yes, the domain is really important. So I made fun out of the people making some default settings for DynamoDB earlier, right? And yeah. Yeah, it's well-intentioned, but there's no <coughs> abstraction there. So I worked with a customer also out of the financial services industry 
And they have uh, an important need when they have a database, whenever they write something to the database, they need a ledger, they need a log basically, right? They need to keep an audit log of every change. So when the auditor comes and says, hey, why does Gregor's bank account have like $10 billion, right? They can say like, well, look, here's the, here's the whole history, right, of that. So, and that is specific to the business domain, right? That is a financial services, this is a ledger, this is something they use in their business domain. So they use DynamoDB and they use DynamoDB streams and things and event bridge pipes and another DynamoDB, like you know, a lot of machinery. So that's like operating system, right? That's like disk sectors and head seeking. So they use cloud services, but on top, they define a service which they call ledgered database. And yeah. even though that seems like a small nuance, I find that that makes all the difference because now they found a real abstraction. This is no longer DynamoDB with default settings, even though technically you could claim that, but it is something that is closer to the business domain because the yeah. business will say, hey, that kind of database needs to be ledgered. And then they have one construct, which is ledger database, and it matches that. So this lifting it into the, I, the sort of the technical business domain, I think that really, that's where platforms can provide a lot of value. Yes, yeah, I, I, I'd agree with that entirely. And, 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 and the, the need then for the people that are doing this engineering is going back to what I was saying earlier, I think, which is that this is certainly at least an aspect of just regular software design. You know, you've got to find these lines of abstractions that make sense. And to do that, you, under, you need to understand the problem that you're trying to solve really well. Whether that's a technical problem um, or whether that's a, a business problem, <clears throat> uh, and and you've got you you know you, you've got to, you've got to be focused on solving that problem rather than just building some random collection of cool tools. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that absolutely. And and a, and a friend of mine actually has articulated this interestingly. So he said a lot of organizations fall into the into the trap or sort of the the vicious cycle of thinking. We don't have enough development talent because that's where the platform story often starts. And like, yeah. you know, we can't get enough highly skilled and fully trained developers. So let's make a platform so that we can make these average developers more productive. But here comes the catch to build a platform. You need much, much better developers, which these organizations surely don't have. Yeah. And then the whole thing sort of downward spirals. And it's not actually funny even because a lot of organizations find themselves in, in that position. So yes, you need really good software engineering discipline to even think about building something like this. That's part one. And part two is to, to amplify again the example I gave. It's kind of counterintuitive. People think as the platform, it's something that sits underneath the development, right? So people would think that it has to be something very, very technical. But the example I just gave is not actually deeper down technical. It's closer to the domain that this IT organization is operating in. And that actually works much better. So even though the platform sits underneath, the concepts that the platform should express should actually be higher level concepts. And I think there folks stumble a lot, especially if it's run out of an infrastructure team, because they will not know the business domain well enough to make a platform that has real abstractions that represent business, yeah. business needs from that domain. I, su I suppose the counter of that, uh, of that is, is, does that mean that if a, an internal platform team is trying to provide services that are completely generic, that's probably a warning sign. I, I would imagine it might be. I, one of the things that I pointed out in one of my videos on platform engineering was teams that were essentially just trying to, to out Google Google or out Amazon Amazon in terms of their cloud services, which just seemed like a ridiculous idea to me. <clears throat> yes. So, well, on, on one hand, I give them some credit for not building everything from scratch. So it's like it's good <laughs> to try to build on top. But of course, you get absolutely zero points for trying to reinvent the wheel and sort of second guessing uh, the cloud providers. Um, I have a lot of metaphors in this book and the metaphor that works best for this one is the sinking versus the floating platform. So let's say you build on top of a cloud platform and you have a genuine need that the cloud doesn't currently include. And 
many years ago, I did something like that. I wanted a fully integrated CI CD pipeline, and this was on premises, but most of the base platforms didn't have that. So I built one, but mm -hmm. of course the providers don't stand still, right? And by now every cloud has a fully integrated tool chain, build tools, source repo, right? So a lot of progress has been made. Now that puts you in an interesting position, right? Now that's what I call the, you're going underwater, Basically, the ocean levels are, are rising in a way, right? Yeah. Your base platform is growing. And if your platform doesn't evolve, then you have duplicated something that's already there. So um, starting by duplicating stuff is probably the worst idea and easily dismissed. But more dangerous is you generally build something on top, and that's nice. But now it goes underwater, and now it's duplicated. And that forces you to make some decisions. Do I maintain this, right? And that means, you know, duplication. And everybody would say, you know, the economic economics cannot be good. So the idea would be, yeah, I shed this out of my platform and I invest in something else that the base platform doesn't have. There's always a catch. So here's the catch. Intellectually, everybody would say, yes, my pla my platform should float, right? As the base platform should goes up, my platform mm -hmm. should also do new things. Yeah. So then comes the reality. And the reality is, oh, you have users on the existing platform. So if you change something, you have migration, you have investment in the existing platform. So management will say, oh, where's my return, right? If you throw this away, who's going to pay for this, right? You have a recovery horizon of many years. So what I'm trying to do is with these kind of funny metaphors of like submarine versus boat, are you near floating or, or sinking, is to give people some decision discipline. Because what I see all the time is, intellectually in the abstract everybody like yeah yeah this should float it's all you know makes sense and then when the reality hits people fall back into exactly the opposite and that's poor decision discipline so these yeah, metaphors yeah. can help you to say like hey i thought we're gonna float why are we a submarine now right and then people yeah. are like oh yeah can i think about that <laughs> and, and that that kind kind of peripherally brings in another one of your your very nice metaphors the idea of architecture as a, an options process you know you need to keep your option you know you need to manage your options effectively and if you want to invest in, in in submarine you know boats floating rather than submarines under under the water that those are different economic decisions as well as everything you know uh, you know te techno economic decisions Co to make as part of the engineering process yeah <clears throat> and it comes exactly back to your point is you're taking the high road of software engineering and architecture yeah. yeah right so it's unsurprising that a lot of the advice we end up giving is like oh you should be a good engineer or good architect <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's, it's 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 unsurprising but you maneuvered yourself into a field that i would say is less forgiving right yes. because you have internal customers you have people on top of it you have published yeah. interfaces you have different economics so you propelled yourself really sort of into the perfect storm of this thing, which can be really great, but also you set the bar for yourself very, very high. And that's always remind people, right? Is uh, that what you want to do? Yeah, I, I, I think you're saying something that I believe very strongly, which is, which is that I, I think platforms are amongst the, the most valuable ideas in terms of structuring large scale systems, and at the same time, the most difficult things to do well. Absolutely. As we, this is this as is kind do. of the the peak of good architecture and good engineering, really. Yeah, yeah, and then, yeah. Look at the examples we had, right? Who who yeah, wants yeah. themselves in a world without printer driver and without decent operating system? Who wants themselves back in a world without being able to provision code in the cloud and it runs serverless without much doing anything, right? So, yeah. so the power of this is very clear. But yeah, you you put yourself on the tip of that pyramid. Yeah. Right. And as I said, this can work well internally. If you understand your domain very well, <coughs> if you have good discipline, you can make assumptions that other people cannot. You can increase productivity. You can harmonize and at the same time boost innovation. Right. That's sort of the magical mix of platforms. Yeah. Yes, it can be done, but it's not going to fall in your lap. <laughs> yeah. is the is the second part of the lesson. So, so the other word that's in the in the title of your book is strategy. So, yes. so, 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 how? What are some of the strategies that we can adopt to do a better job of this incredibly difficult thing? 
Yeah, and and we 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 both used to be consultants, so we probably have a a special relationship <laughs> to the word strategy. Yeah, I think I actually wrote in one book, and this is yeah, since we're already dishing out everywhere, this was sort of an old ThoughtWorks kind of joke. Like whenever we had a project that um could only have our our most skilled people was in a really far away location and made almost no money, then it was strategic. <laughs> so that was the way to kind of yeah. pitch, oh, but it's highly strategic. <laughs> so so I always uh, joke about this here. Yeah, strategy is one of those so those words where it's it's everywhere and nowhere, but I feel strongly that is you set out on these big endeavors, right? So the platform strategy book is the second in a series, right? We talked last time about architect elevator and cloud strategy. So these big things like I'm going to the cloud, I'm building a platform. I think you really do need a strategy. Now, the interesting thing about this is that the strategy cannot be a painting by numbers exercise, right? The books are not stack overflow where it's like, oh, I need to do this thing. Give me the five lines of code that I need to paste in. And it's now not, Gen AI will do that anyway. Not, not so, cut and paste architecture. <laughs> no, and it's not cut and paste strategy, exactly. And Gen AI will not write it for you either. Sorry. So the, the books are walking a fine line, right? So the books in one way, because they can't just give you the answer because how does the book, how do I know what's the right answer for what you're yeah. trying to do, right? Only you would know. So the books need to go a little bit meta, right? They need to go one level up to say, how do you make the right decisions? How do you find the right frameworks? Here's a good model. Here's a good framework to use without becoming so meta that it becomes a book for like how to be a management consultant, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, you should have good decision <laughs> discipline and you should use two by two matrix. And, you know, so, so walking that line is probably the biggest challenge in writing these books to zoom out one level, explain to people how you make this decision, but then stay connected to the topic and say, no, here's a concrete decision like the floating versus sinking, right? Here's a concrete decision that is specific to platform. So, so straddling that line is, probably the reason I started writing this book like two years, three years, three years ago. <laughs> and uh, now in early release on LeanPub, meaning it's sort of a Kickstarter kind of model, we're still in the early cycles where I'm still actively writing on it. That's mm -hmm. probably, besides my procrastination, that's probably the real reason that it's not that easy to write a strategy book like that. Yeah, yeah. I, that description of, um... Uh, the way that you kind of position the advice is is, is probably the best description of the, the way that I write books that I've heard, <laughs> which is trying to find that that kind of meta level. It's, yeah, I uh, call it the, the the twilight zone of architecture. Right, yeah, everybody yeah. <laughs> likes to talk about buzzwords. Everybody likes to talk about technology, but in between is sort of this twilight zone, which is like, oh, everybody finds this very fascinating, yeah. but getting like actionable advice that doesn't fall into one or the other is actually not easy. Right? Yeah. It's taken me years to, to get my, hopefully I'm getting the balance reasonably, right? But it's taken me years to kind of finesse that. Yeah. Um, so so th this book's part of your Architect Elevator series. So, 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 so how, is, is this a book that kind of spans the levels or is this a book that's positioned at a p particular floor of, that the elevator stops at? Hmm. So that's a good question. And my ambition is clearly right. And that's why the series is called the architect elevator, right? From like the strategic penthouse to the engine room. So the book is spanning this. So for example, there will be strategic frameworks are in there. So how to chart a roadmap and how to have good decision discipline. So some of those topics are in there. Then you have the mid levels. So things like floating and sinking or fruit baskets versus fruit salads, you have these metaphors that make decision making approachable to a wide range of audience, right? But it's definitely a few floors down on the elevator. <coughs> and then you will also have some specific things close to home for people who build platforms for like, hey, should I just make Terraform modules or should I make templates, right? Or should I do this in CDK, right? These are like very, very concrete things that people a few floor downs um, will have to answer. So the book goes through all these levels and then it comes back out and it goes a little bit into organizational and, and team aspects. Now, 
the way I, the, well, let me put it this way. The reason I'm doing this is because I do want to stretch the reader's horizon, right? This is not a quick answer kind of book, but I'm like, hey, even if you think you're more of an IT executive or business user, right? The shape of your platform and the value proposition and the fruit salads and the floating sinking, right? That is relevant to you. So I highly encourage you, <laughs> force you as much as I can as an author, I highly encourage you to concern yourself with that. But having said this, also the book will be that you don't need to read all chapters. So if you're an IT executive and you say, you know, the Terraform template thing, that's maybe a little bit few floors too down for me, I make my architects read that, right? So the connection is still there, but the ambition is in the end because I so strongly believe that you cannot run a business by remote control. You can't sit on the yeah. top and say, oh, I heard platforms are good, so please make me a platform strategy, guaranteed disaster, and vice versa, right? Where somebody says, oh, Technically, platforms must be good, so it must be good for my business, even though I don't understand the domain or I don't care. Equal disaster. So I feel so strong that the connection is needed. So that's what the books are, in fact, trying trying to do. Yeah. So, so one of one of the one of the places that popularized the ideas of platforms recently is that it was in the team topo the wonderful team topologies book. Yep. Uh, and platform teams is one of the five team types that they specifically called out, and and probably one of the most resonant ones I would I would I would suggest. Um, and part of that model is about the reduction of cognitive load. So I wondered if you'd just like to talk a little bit about that and the, the, the value of platforms in in doing that, and maybe some examples of where you've seen that getting it right. Yeah, and we owe a lot, obviously, to, to Matt and, and Manuel for that book, right? It's really yeah. brought the vocabulary into everybody's mindset. Now, yeah. as we said before, there's always a group of people who also abuse that. So I've seen people justify just about everything by saying, oh, it's a platform team. Oh, it's team topologies. So, and I'm sure, <laughs> sure our friends are well aware of this, but the net contribution is huge, right? That yes. this, um, I mean, for like four decades, we've been citing Conway's law and we're like, oh, that's really great. And yeah. Mel is, is a great guy, but it was about time sort of we layer one thing on top of that. And I think team topologies was really successful in yeah. doing that. And the premise to just retell the story in a, in a super compact format is um, a lot of what we've done to our development processes is to shift everything left, right? Because we realize that this big team separation, right? You have one team who makes the requirements, another team who builds, another one who tests, and another one who does operations. You know, well, thanks partly to your books, we, are, we have learned that that is a very bad idea. And if, if people haven't learned that by actual pain, if they yeah. needed a book, then I think continuous <laughs> delivery kind of did a lot to tell them that. So the answer rightly so has been, okay, if splitting this across many teams doesn't work, the logical maneuver is, well, we collapse that and we have great yeah. names for this. <clears throat> Shift left, DevOps, DevSecOps, DevArcSecOps, right? It's like we have fancy names, but here comes the catch. You piling everything onto one team, right? Like now you're like, yeah. oh, you're supposed to know the business domain. You're supposed to know dis distributed systems, all the AWS APIs, uh, operations, please, on top of that. And you should also be a nice person and be good with people and get funding and just like, oh, great, right? If you could do all that, I have my own company. Yeah. <laughs> so that's where the cognitive load becomes the limiting element, right? You're piling everything on. So unless you make it easier for people, there's no way they can actually manage. So that is perfect. And as I said, <coughs> folks, right? in an organization, you can make more assumptions, you understand your domain better. So you have mechanisms, you have levers, you can pull to actually get that cognitive load down. The catch always is that the reality of doing this is is, is harder, right? So yeah. the two examples I gave, right? Taking puzzle pieces away, that increases cognitive load. And I see this sadly done, done a lot. The getting things out of the business domain, really defining higher level abstracts, right? Whether it's a ledger database or a hosted website or something that is meaningful as a construct, I think that can really actually reduce the, the cognitive load. The, the, the test that it needs to pass is the thing that you call abstraction, which you promise people will reduce your cognitive load. That must make sense without knowing the layer underneath. Yes. And I think that leads you to two conclusions. The first one is 
trying to do this across a whole cloud services layer is probably a bad idea, right? Because yeah. how are you going to come up with a whole new vocabulary where people don't need to know any of the 200 services underneath, right? And you make this magical thing, you're like, Ooh, you must be a lot smarter than me. But doing it in specific domains, right, where you have knowledge like this ledger database, right, as simple as that. I like the example because it's yeah. so obvious once you, you, you have it, right? There, I think you have a real opportunity to, to reduce the, the cognitive load. But sadly, I find this also these days to be one of the most abused words, right, that happens all the time. Basically, every governance team now says, oh, I, I restrict your choices and it's good for you because your cognitive mm -hmm. load goes down. Yeah. But really what I want to do is I want you to not use stuff that I don't like you, yeah. that I don't like yeah. you doing. So um, great success in bringing this term into the forefront. I think we owe yeah, Matt Emanuel a lot. Um, be careful for people misappropriating the terms for their own for their own benefit. No? Yeah, yeah, and, and, and it's 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 that thing of uh, uh, to me, our conversation it keeps coming back to this idea of of you know having a model of the problem domain and 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 working within that con construct is is what gives us good insight into making these kinds of difficult but valuable choices. Cool. Correct. You need to, um, I often draw, I like drawing pictures. So one picture I drew is that these classic, what people called business platforms in the old days that didn't work, they always drew a pyramid, right? And the yeah. idea was a base layer big and it's all the common stuff. And then you just put the cherry on the, on the cake and we learned that doesn't work yeah. because it assumes you can anticipate everything that will come. And that's probably a bad assumption. So what I uh, draw for, um, for platforms is more sort of like a double triangle, right? You have a lot of complexity at the bottom that you hide, that's great. But on top of it, you have the inverse pyramid because that is sort of the unlimited opportunity yes. of things that people can build. And your example of operating systems is perfect for that, or the cloud likewise, right? Yeah. A lot of tech complexity hidden, but on top, again, you, you have this like relatively narrow interface compared to what's underneath. But on top of that, you know, the universe opens back yeah. up as we already concluded, that is really nice, but it's also really difficult to do. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and that brings us rather nicely into what I understand you're doing now in your day job, because, what, because you're looking at trying to come up with more natural programming models, as I understand it, for, for cloud services, cloud infrastructure. So, so is there anything that you can tell us about that and what you're doing and the kinds of things that you're you're looking to achieve. Ah, very, very interesting. Yeah. So yeah, I'm down in the engine room. I'm building parts of a platform, pretty fun. And I was going to say advanced, but that sounds kind of self elevating like sort of what we consider modern cloud stuff, right? Like serverless, that's yeah. how we think, hey, that's, that's how the cloud wanted you to write applications. So like, I'm, I'm right there. So yeah, we have interesting discussions about this internally. And one of the biggest ones is how much complexity to hide versus how much complexity to expose. Somebody on LinkedIn actually made a really nice comment. He said, a lot of platforms fall into the trap of wanting to hide all the complexity as yeah. opposed to making it easier for you to deal with the complexity. And I found that yeah. captures it really well. And you can make the counter argument, hey, so long, isn't hiding complexity much better? And the short answer is no, because you end up with these illusions. So give you a very concrete example. So I work on serverless integration. Integration deals with distributed systems. Distributed systems have things like out of order delivery, retries, back pressure, time to live, item potency, right? Yeah. Now, the question is, do I try to make those go away or do I make a really good domain model that makes it easier for me to deal with it? And I, I speak very fairly, I'm in the latter camp. So I'm doing a lot yeah. of TypeScript CDK work because, you know, I feel we have so many good tools to model domains well. So I don't believe this distributed system domain is so complex that we cannot model it. Come on, right? Like we, yeah. 30 years of progress should have given us something. So like, let's go do it versus, you know, there's clearly people in the other camp who say our value proposition is that people do not have to deal with this. And there is no easy right or wrong here, but this is very real, right? How much can I take away without building you a dangerous illusion? And I can tell you exactly what the illusion looks like, right? You know, just generically speaking, 
if somebody gives you an API and it has sort of two string settings and three integer settings, and then like 40 pages of documentation explaining what these strings and integers do, no names mentioned, right? <laughs> then that is clearly a bad illusion. That wasn't a good abstraction. So yeah. what I'm working on is bringing the type system back in, right? Like yeah. why is the strings and integers? Why aren't these types? Why don't I have composition and abstraction? All like all the stuff we had for like <coughs> years now, thankfully. Why yeah. don't I bring this into the cloud programming model? I'm I let it out right here for these kind of things. I'm not a fan of YAML for pure infrastructure, totally fine. Yeah. But for sort of richer serverless asynchronous integration things, you have a richer domain and you want a domain language and you yes. want to embed that in a proper programming language. You know, you want to have something like like TypeScript, for example. So that is totally real. That's what I'm working on. And those are some of the debates I have at the workplace every day. It sounds like a fascinating project, and 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 one of the things that's always that's always enthused me when I've been doing in-house platforms and so on. It's it's part of thinking of it as part of a programming model, I guess. Is is you know you, you're coming up with a coherent programming model that makes life easier without, as you say, without restricting the capabilities of people to to take yep. advantage of it. Uh, and that's and, like I was, I was uh, chatting yeah, with Eric, Eric, yeah, yeah. Eric Evans uh, just recently because our books are equally old. They only they were yeah, like yeah. born um, like a few weeks apart. So we're actually writing an article about twentieth anniversary of enterprise yeah. integration patterns and yeah. DDD. And Eric himself, he says, yeah, like um, DDD had a huge success, like in the business domains. Like the book has like the shipping yeah. domain as an example, right? And people, yeah. when there's DDD conferences left, right, and center, right? So people are like, oh, this is really valuable. But now what people are realizing is our technical domain is also sufficiently complex enough. When you build operating systems, the domain model was there, like, you know, streams and sockets and files, but we yeah. didn't think of that as a very complex domain. It just kind of like any good domain, if it's right, it seems obvious. Yeah. But now take cloud runtimes, right? I mean, all the amazing things they can yeah. do, but that domain is sufficiently complex that a lot of DDD now applies to this technical or this techno business right the ledger database kind of thing right yeah like in that domain and eric sees a lot of um uptick in this as well because that layer in your system is super important now and complex enough that you need proper ddd for that yeah 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 and i i think that's exactly right and and i i think that's a reasonably good e description of the kind of things that we were doing at LMAX with with our service like uh, our our service level platform so we we were we were adding a lot of those kind of facilities very high performance event based um support solving some of the the distributed infrastructure problems that you were talking about earlier or at least abstracting the way in which they worked yeah, and, yeah, and and, and, and I'm, I'm I'm a big proponent of asynchronous systems to as one of the foundations of being able to to, to do that, and I, I really hope that that's the direction that the cloud providers will take. I'm looking forward to that kind yeah, of act, have... act, active base stateful serverless is is one of the things that I I I want. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so, so we we obviously do a do a lot right in terms of event driven architectures, right? Yeah. Proposing these applications through events with asynchrony. So it's funny, like enterprise integration patterns has a a huge re revival there, right? Yeah. Because that's the the architectures that now yeah. finally become easier to build. And you know, coming back to your comment, right? The one huge advantage is that now these systems are actually programmable. So in, in the past, yes. when you wanted to make a domain language for the things you said, like the eventing and asynchrony, yeah. that was kind of on paper mostly right at the time because yeah. the deployments were still manual. So now that whole machinery, i cautious to say infrastructure because it's much more than that, but this yeah. whole machinery is now programmable. So what I find really fascinating is that sort of the languages and the nuances that we as architects like to express, now we can cast that into a real programming model and that is running code, right? That yeah. executes and provisions cloud resources. And we, we complained a lot about that yeah, you know, in the old days we already had everything that we didn't have. So so yeah. that is one thing that is massive, and I think that we should really appreciate that now. If you sort of 
codify the domain language of your architecture, that is actually executable code. And I think that's pretty cool. So at least I have fun working in this. <laughs> yeah, it sounds absolutely fascinating. And uh, we, we're about at time. So I'll, I'll take this opportunity to say thanks again for being a, a wonderful guest on uh, on the in the engineering room, Gregor. It's always a pleasure talking to you. Uh, yeah, and always my pleasure. And yeah. for folks who are interested, right, uh, it's called Platform <clears throat> Strategy is the name of the book. Currently, it's on LeanPub because I'm still making updates. So um, have a look. Have a look there, and well, let me know what what do you think. Right, <laughs> it takes a village, I think, to to get that topic really really tackled. Yeah, yeah. So so thanks too for it to everybody for watching, and thanks once again to Equal Experts for supporting uh, the engineering room. And bye bye.